trader from Karth told me that dragons come from the moon. The moon? He told me the moon was an egg, Khaleesi. That once there were two moons in the sky, but one wandered too close to the sun and it cracked from the heat. Out of it poured a thousand thousand dragons and they drank the sun's fire. Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with some juice to get you through the long night. And today, we are going to actually talk about the long night. In my last video, I talked a little bit about the Valerians and Targaryens, and today we are going to expand on it. If you have not checked out my buddy, Lucifer Means Lightbringer, the Dragon LML, the Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire, then I'm going to leave all of his information in the description box so you can check out his channel. I'm also going to link a few specific videos because a lot of what I'm gonna talk about in this video stems from those videos in LML's Long Night Moon Meteor Theory. I have some juicy juice to go along with his theory that kind of corroborates his theory. So we're going to be traveling through the great empire of the dawn. We're gonna be riding on comets. It's about to be lit. Also, exciting news. I will be a guest on a live stream on LML's channel on June the 16th with Tony Quinn and LML and myself. So you don't want to miss this. Make sure you subscribe to LML's channel if you're not already so you don't miss it. Okay, so today I want to talk about the original Long Night and the legends that surround it and the rebirth of dragons and basically how this is the basis for possibly everything ever. So LML has done a tremendous amount of work on the mythology and symbolism and astrology and I'm not going to repeat all of it, but I'll link you to the video that sums up everything. So we have a few different theories about where dragons come from. The Septon appears to have considered various legends examining the origins of dragons and how they came to be controlled by the Valerians. The Valerians themselves claim that dragons sprung forth as the children of the 14 flames, while in Karth the tale states that there was once a second moon in the sky. One day this moon was scalded by the sun and cracked like an egg, and a million dragons poured forth. In a shy, the tales are many and confused, but certain texts, all and possibly ancient, claim that dragons first came from the shadow, a place where all of our learning fails us. These Ashai histories say that people so ancient they had no name first tamed dragons in the shadow and brought them to Valyria, teaching the Valyrians their art before departing from the annals. So there's three different stories of how dragons came into the world, basically. But before we can examine where dragons come from, we must first look at ancient planet souls and the great empire of the dawn. In the beginning, the priestly scribes of Yin declare all the land between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the Shivering Sea to the Jade Sea, including even the great and holy Isle of Ling, formed a single realm ruled by the God on Earth, the only begotten son of the Lion of Night and the Maiden Maid of Light, who traveled about his domains in a palanquin carved from a single pearl and carried by a hundred queens, his wives. For 10,000 years, the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the God on Earth until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebearers. Dominion over mankind then passed to his eldest son, who was known as the Pearl Emperor and ruled for a thousand years. The Jade Emperor, the Tourmaline Emperor, the Onyx Emperor, the Topaz Emperor, and the Opal Emperor followed in turn each reigning for centuries. Yet every reign was shorter and more troubled than the one preceding it, for wild men and baleful beasts pressed at the borders of the great empire. Lesser kings grew prideful and rebellious, and the common people gave themselves over to avarice, envy, lust, murder, incest, gluttony, and sloth. When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture, and necromancy, enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his bride, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. In the annals of the further east, it was the blood betrayal as his usurpation is named that ushered in an age of darkness called the Long Night. Despairing of the evil that had been unleashed on earth, 
The maiden made of light turned her back upon the world, and the lion of night came forth in all of his wrath to punish the wickedness of men. So it is LML's theory that Ashai was a part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. So I'm just going to look at Ashai as the capital of the Great Empire of Dawn. Ashai is not only mysterious, it's huge. Behind the walls of Ashai, you could fit King's Landing, Old Town, Volantis, and Karth side by side. So think of Ashai as the capital of the Great Empire of Dawn, the ruling seat of the Gemstone Emperors. So imagine the Bloodstone Emperor is in Ashai and he's doing some dark magic there. He has committed the blood betrayal and he's possibly even a Zora High. And he's the one who ushers in the Long Night. But how did he do it? And what happened in Ashai that made it greasy and oily and otherworldly, alien-like almost? So let's talk. So in theory, we have the Bloodstone Emperor and he's just the king of bad shit, allegedly. He's working dark magic. He does the blood betrayal, but it's also likely this blood betrayal is also the forging of Lightbringer. And that's what he's doing. So it says that when Nisa Nisa was stabbed, it cracked the face of the moon. This could mean literally or figuratively, but here's the quote. Azor High thrust the smoking sword through her living heart. It is said that her cry of anguish and ecstasy left a crack across the face of the moon, but her blood and her soul and her strength and her courage all went into the steel. Without getting into all of the symbolism, realistically in the real world, what would bring on a long night? Right now, where you live, what could make it dark for a long, long time right now? Like not just a day, like a month. What could make it dark for a month? If a meteor or a falling star or a comet or an asteroid or something out of this world were to strike the earth, the debris would cause darkness, clouds, starless skies. It, it, would, it would be awful. It would be terrible. It would be devastating. It would cause a long night. We know the children of the forest did some dark magic that broke the arm of Dorne and flooded the neck and changed the map of Planetos. So what if the Bloodstone Emperor did something to break the moon? and calls the long night, something galactical, scientific, and also magical. And as a result of this comet, meteor, asteroid, magical, galactical, cosmic event, the continents break, dragons are born, climate gets all jacked up, seasons are all messed up, winters last a generation, summers last 16 years. That's the kind of thing that would probably happen if you had a magical cosmic event. So let's say that the initial Valerians are a part of the great empire of the dawn, which that's LML's theory. I think I have some juice that corroborates that. So let's say this comet happens or this asteroid or this cosmic event happens and the Valerians are a part of the great empire. They may be even in a shy um, and they see this bright light. Which brings me back to the Alexandra Genesis Egyptian legend from the real world. So over a thousand years ago, on a dark and quiet moonless night, the people of Egypt were in their households and getting ready for bed when an astonishing bright white light invaded the atmosphere and infiltrated the homesteads of the peaceful Egyptians. Everyone who went outside to see looked up and instantly their eyes turned purple and their skin became an iridescent white. From that time forward, those who had seen the light were referred to as the spirit people. So these Egyptian spirit people could be what George bases the Valyrians on. So people with said Alexandra Genesis are said not only to have pale skin that doesn't burn in the sun and purple eyes, but they also allegedly have superhuman immune systems. And Targaryens have these traits. Well, at least Daenerys does. Your grace should not be here breathing these black humors. I am blood of the dragon, Danny reminded him. Have you ever seen a dragon with the flux? Viserys had oft claimed that Targaryens were untroubled by the pestilence that afflicted common men. And so far as she could tell, it was true. She could remember being cold and hungry and afraid, but never sick. So Daenerys never being sick, Daenerys having purple eyes, Daenerys having pale skin that doesn't burn in the sun, all of that is on brand for Alexandria Genesis. So I start to wonder, 
And I look for people in real life that have this so-called Alexandria Genesis. And lo and behold, I found one. And who it is makes it more interesting. So I find that Elizabeth Taylor had purple eyes and it was rumored that she had Alexandria Genesis. So then the wheels get going. I'm sharing my findings with LML. We're going back and forth in chat. And Elizabeth Taylor played Cleopatra in a movie in during George's time. So George compares Daenerys to historical Cleopatra. But the image of Cleopatra with purple eyes likely comes from Elizabeth Taylor, who has Alexandria Genesis. And not only that, this is what George says about Elizabeth Taylor. I think it was Elizabeth Taylor at the peak of her. His voice tails off before he clarifies. She was the most beautiful woman in the world. I think I was nine years old when I saw that movie. How could you not fall in love with her? George thinks that Elizabeth Taylor is the most beautiful woman in the world. And that's what is often said about Daenerys in the books. So George was inspired by a purple-eyed Cleopatra actress that had Alexandra Genesis. And we know the legend now. We know the Egyptian legend that Alexandria Genesis is based off of, which falls in line with a moon meteor or some kind of cosmic event that just goes crazy. So let's say the Valerians are some of these people who see this bright light in the sky and it turns their skin pale and their eyes purple. And these spirit people who are shunned are the Valerians. So they leave the Great Empire and go west to Valyria, breaking away from the Great Empire. And after the Long Night, or right before the Long Night ended, the Ashai show up in Valyria, which the Ashai could definitely just be more Valyrians. They show up with dragons and just maybe this was the turning point during the Long Night. If dragons came forth from some kind of cosmic activity dealing with comets and moons, then it is likely that the people whose skin and eyes were affected by the same cosmic activity would be the ones that would control these dragons like no one else could. And coincidentally, after the Long Night, boom, the rise of Valyria. So you might be asking yourself, well, how do you connect the Valyria to the great empire of the dawn. Well, if you go back to when Daenerys first hatches her dragons in the books, she has a dream, the wake the dragon dream. LML Quinn and I talked about waking the dragon in depth. I'll link that, but Daenerys dreams of her ancestors. Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white. And their eyes were opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. So the eyes that are described of the ghost or of Daenerys' ancestors, they have gemstone eyes. And all of those gemstones happen to be gemstone emperors or empresses, tourmaline, amethyst, jade, and opal. It's not coincidental. At least it doesn't seem like it is. But they are pushing Daenerys to wake the dragon. And how does she do it? She does it symbolically. Drogo calls Daenerys moon of his life. And she calls Drogo her sun and stars. Daenerys, the moon, wanders too close to the sun. Drogo ends out pops a thousand thousand dragons. Well, really just three. So you can see how Daenerys waking dragons is echoing the legends that come from the annals of Ashai or the capital of the great empire of the dawn. Let's say this meteor or this comet or whatever it was struck a shy and now there's nothing but greasy black stone, malformed fish, nothing can live or grow there and water is undrinkable. A shy is like ground zero and all that remains is weird shit and greasy black stone, which is also weird shit. So let's go a step further and say that the moon is right over a shy and a comet bangs into it and comet juice spills all over a shot. So comets are basically made up of ice, dust, carbon dioxide, and methane gas. In the real world, there are stones that have what is called a greasy luster or an oily luster or look to them. And some scientists believe that in some cases, it can be caused by methane gas. So if a cosmic impact happened near or in a shy, that's why the stone is greasy. But what are your thoughts on all of this? Like, what could it mean for the story? I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm not 100% settled in my thoughts on The Long Night, but I'm definitely drinking 
LML's Moon Tea and Comet Juice. So don't forget to check out his channel and let me know what you think of this video. And let me know if you've found anything that supports a cosmic event that calls the long night. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone that supports me on Patreon. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and join the Sweet Summer family. Okay, Shame. my sweet summer children, have a good day. Shame. Shame.